Hi, thanks for tuning in today. Today I want to share with you um, just some thoughts concerning what's been called the longer ending of Mark. I consider it just to be the ending of Mark. There's a recent video that was done that was about two hours long by Mike Winger where he presents the evidence as he sees it. And I just sort of wanted to do a response to that. There's going to be plenty of responses, I think, to that video that are bombastic and um, heavy hitting. This isn't that kind of video. This is a different perspective than his. I am uh, ha have no quarrel with Mike Winger. In fact, he's got thousands of hours, or at least hundreds of hours of content online on YouTube. I probably maybe watched five or six hours of his content and everything that he's put out there, I've enjoyed. I enjoyed this video that he made. I just uh, happened to have a different perspective on it and would look at it differently, look at the evidence differently than he does. And I just want to share my thoughts with you. I am not a textual critic. I'm not an expert. Um, Mike Winger is not claiming to be an expert either. Just um, I'm just a Christian who's um, interested in the subject and people seem to be interested in some of the things I've had to say in regards to this subject. So I'll share my thoughts with you and just kind of review that uh, video and give you maybe my perspective on that. So Mike starts out his video, he spends about 40 minutes to 45 minutes kind of discussing some of the um, external um, evidence in regards to whether we should retain or leave out what's been called the longer ending of Mark. And so what's interesting to me about that as he lays out his case, um, what we're talking about here is verse 9 to verse 16. Many modern scholars think we ought to uh, remove that or at least bracket it off and consider it non, um, non-canonical or, or non-scriptural. There's some different perspectives. But most people, most scholars, um, most recent commentaries by scholars on Mark in some way will treat that as something that's not been written as Mark and not on the same caliber of scripture as the rest of Mark. So uh, Mike dove into that and he spent quite a bit of time looking at the um, external evidence. I think he spent like 45 to 50 minutes or so discussing um, Codex Vaticanus, uh, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Now the evidence here, um, we need to be pretty clear about this. When we're talking about our Greek manuscripts, the Greek witnesses, which are, should be our primary um, source of data on this, are overwhelming, overwhelmingly supportive of the longer ending, what's been called the longer ending of Mark. Um, there are only two manuscripts that are undisputed. There's a third one uh, that he goes into uh, that is a commentary on the book of Mark that also doesn't contain it, but that, that particular manuscript's a little bit more debated, but two, two for sure, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, uh, do not contain um, these last verses of Mark. And he goes into some depth on the pushback on those two manuscripts. But we have somewhere in the neighborhood of um, over 1,600 witnesses to Mark. All the rest of those Greek manuscripts contain those words. So we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 99 you know, I, I, I didn't run the calculation, but like 99.5% of our manuscripts uh, contain the words, only two or three, depending on how you count it, two, at the most three, totally omit the words, okay? And he spends a lot of time on this. And what's interesting about those two manuscripts is, is, is that there are anomalies about those manuscripts. Now he spends those that 40 to 50 minutes trying to show that those, not trying to show, just kind of weighing the, the evidence of whether we should consider those anomalies significant or not. The anomalies being that Vaticanus leaves a large section, a blank section there, which 
you could potentially uh, fill with the, uh, the long, what's called the long ending of bark. Now, just for the purposes of this video, again, I believe that is the ending of bark. When I say the longer ending of bark, I'm just using the terminology for simplicity's sake. Um, so bear with me. So the the you could fit the longer ending there uh, in that blank section. And uh, some scholars have thought that that was intentionally left blank because the scribe of Vaticanus actually was aware of those, uh, aware of the ending of Mark. Um, and so that he could fill it in later on. Now, I, unlike um, Mike Winger, Mike Winger came to the conclusion that that was maybe less likely. I, I'm on the other side. I think that's probably pretty likely. Um, but regardless, again, you can, you can get lost in this. And, and he, again, he spends 40 to 50 minutes discussing how these an anomalies, coming to the conclusion that these anomalies don't necessarily provide support for the longer ending. Okay, granted, fine. Uh, that, uh, okay, so that still only leaves you with two solid Greek witnesses two solid Greek witnesses, three, possibly three solid Greek witnesses that don't contain um, the longer ending. And even those have uh, some, two of them, the two Sinaiticus of Vaticanus have strange anomalies about them uh, that make people think that possibly they were even aware of the, um, of the longer ending of Mark. So to me, here's the thing. Here, here's my thought on this. Um, you're going to throw out the testimony. So you often hear textual critics brag about the embarrassment of riches, that we have over 5,000 Greek um, uh, manuscripts and, and how, how that compares to Homer and all these others. But if you're going to throw out the testimony, your vast bulk of your manuscripts in favor of only two manuscripts, to me, what... What, it almost makes it seem like an idle boast. Now, that's not to say that there's not other evidence uh, I'm against the longer ending of Mark. And Mike Winger goes into that. There's a testimony of um, there's a testimony of Eusebius and Jerome. I don't know if you can hear my daughter uh, tapping away at her little xylophone, but she's there in the background accompanying this this video. So if you hear the uh, background music. That's what my two-year-old's doing. But anyways, so you've got the testimony of Jerome and Eusebius and, and both of them uh, in in the course of a discussion about how to deal with what might be considered a contradiction between Matthew and Mark. They cast some doubt on how many manuscripts contain um, the longer ending. Okay. And again, there's pushback even on their testimony. In the case of Eusebius, um, there he's he's talking about a hypothetical situation, and in the case of Jerome, it seems like he's pretty much just parroting what Eusebius said. Now, Mike Winger had a different take on that, but here's the thing: you still have all the overwhelming support of your Greek witnesses of the manuscript tradition. And they're not just late manuscripts that support it. You have a Codex Alexandrinus. You have a church father unequivocally. Um, you have Irenaeus drawing from the longer ending of, of Mark. And Irenaeus is earlier than both Eusebius and Jerome. Uh, so it's very, very clear that the... Um, longer ending of Mark, both Eusebius and Jerome were aware of it. And it, as a matter of fact, Jerome includes a longer ending in the Vulgate. So whatever you make of his evaluation of how many manuscripts there were, and here's the thing, this is something that I've heard even from someone who disagrees with the, um, disagrees with the longer ending of Mark. When you have somebody saying at that time, you know, if you have somebody like Eusebius or Jerome saying the majority of manuscripts in their time, well, how do they know that? How many manuscripts did Jerome have? Well, it would just be what's, you know, 
close to him in that geographical area, whatever correspondence he had with others. But again, this is the ancient world. It's not the modern world. There's no one cataloging all the manuscripts at that time. So you've got um, you've got two, maybe three uh, manuscripts against your entire Greek manuscript tradition. And you have Eusebius and Jerome, who both um, recognize that the longer ending is in existence and they're they, they just think it's the minority reading, not the majority reading. But then you have early church fathers like Irenaeus, who's earlier than Eusebius and Jerome, and they're quoting from it, um, or, or at least drawing from it. And then you might even have someone who's even earlier, which is Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr's writing in the early 100s, and he's drawing from this text. So the, the weight, you have very early testimony. You have overwhelming manuscript support. And here's the thing. Here, here's the thing that gets me. I, I realize that there are some versions um, that uh, omit the longer ending of Mark. There's some um, translations that omit the longer ending of Mark. But the whole thing about that is the vast majority of even those support the longer ending of Mark. Here's the bottom line for me, is that if 99.5% of our manuscripts can be totally corrupted, what's there to say that 100% of our manuscripts can't become corrupted. Now, you might make an argument to providence and say, well, it was just God's providence that Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were preserved. Now, I want to be very clear with you. If, if you think that that's how modern textual critics argue, it is not. Modern textual critics do not argue based on providence. There was a recent quote by one of their leading um, um, scholars uh, evangelical scholar who basically said that I'm going to do textual criticism as if God doesn't exist. Now, I'm not criticizing him right now. I'm not trying to throw stones at him, but textual critics as a rule treat their profession as a, um, as a science. And when you're reading scholarly uh, treatments on subjects like that, um, you don't see people like um, Daniel Wallace, and Bart Ehrman, and people like that saying, well, I think it's because God preserved these two manuscripts. Um, it's just happenstance as far as the textual critic, when he's doing text critical work. Now, he might, on his personal level, believe that God has done it, um, providentially preserved, something like that. He might believe that on his personal level, but for his text critical work, he sort of brackets that and works as if... Um, there's no providential guidance here. And so if you are working in that framework, what's to say that uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus didn't just get lost? And if they had been lost, then 100% of our manuscripts, Greek witnesses would have been corrupted. Now that's a startling thought. I mean, at least it is for me. It's a startling idea that 100% of our manuscripts could be corrupted. And indeed, this is the very same thing. So this, I'm going to move to the second point here. When Mike Winger goes into, um, when Mike Winger goes into the internal evidence. Now, we're really dealing with, um, what is it, 12 verses here? And then it, you're supposed to, judge based on the internal evidence that maybe there's some stylistic differences, uh, differences in words that are used. And there's a lot of, of, of serious scholarship that's gone into that. I'm not just um, sweeping that off to the side. However, if you're using critical methods, critical scholarship, you, you have to realize that the majority of critical scholars today also reject John chapter 21. They reject John 21. Now, why do they do that? Because 100% of our, our manuscripts witness to uh, what I'll call the, the longer ending of John. 100% of our manuscripts witness to John chapter 21. I believe that, that John wrote that and that that is scripture. 
A hundred percent of our manuscripts witness it, witness to it, but the majority of critical scholars reject it because of stylistic differences. Now, um, if you're going to argue based on on style and 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 um, particular words and vocabulary, if you if you go down that road, uh, also critical scholars reject First uh, Timothy. They reject Second Timothy as being written by Paul. They don't think Paul wrote those because there's different stylistic differences. Now, evangelical scholars can push back on that and say this is a different circumstance and there's different reasons why. I'll share with you just a, a, a quick anecdote from my own life. Um, my mom had passed away when I was 18, almost 19 years old. And so here I was, an 18-year-old, and suddenly a big weight fell on my shoulders. Um, my parents were divorced at that time, and so dealing with the matters of a state sort of fell on me. Well, there was a document that appeared that was supposedly from my mom. But what was interesting about that document is that um, she had actually spelled her name differently than the, the normal way that she spelled her name. She used vocabulary in, in that letter, and I won't tell you what it was, but um, she used some language that I'd never heard my mother use before. And um, this was offered as evidence about some of the stuff that should be given. However, I came to the conclusion, even though I'd never seen my mom use that sort of vocabulary, and even though she'd spelled her name wrong, I knew the circumstances in which she was um, in, and I understood the mindset that she would, uh, was going to be in, and because of how, actually how well I knew my mother, the things that someone who actually just kind of had a... Um, acquaintance with my mother might have thrown out as spurious because I knew my mother so well. I knew that there were a state of affairs where these things could have prevailed and I actually accepted that that letter had actually come from my mother. The style of her writing was different. <laughs> there was anomalies about it, but I actually came to the conclusion that it was authentic. And so uh, many people, many people who have thrown off and used um, stylistic arguments. Here's the thing: there are not that many people in the world who who know uh, Koine Greek to the level that the early church fathers did, and the early church fathers are not making <laughs> these sorts of arguments that modern scholars are. There's many people who have thrown out the argument about stylistic differences in, in, in Mark, who if you threw them a Greek New Testament and said, go and start reading and live translating, many of those people would struggle with it. Not all, but there's, there's there are some who have made this argument. So I, I'm very leery of using just 12 verses and saying, I know for sure that there's the style is so different when an early church father like Irenaeus and a vast number, a vast array of other early church fathers could read this and never find any issues um, in regards to uh, stylistic uh, differences. So I, I find those sorts of arguments um, tenuous unless you're going to be very consistent about it and apply the same standards um, to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, um, John chapter 21, um, some people would say Ephesians even. Uh, Ephesians is more well accepted than, than these others, but there's, I mean, so are you going to apply those same sorts of, of, of standards? Um, so I'm a little bit leery um, in regards to throwing it out based on these um, stylistic differences, um, based on the fact that there's all sorts of, I don't think that Mark was written all in one day. I don't think he wrote the gospel out all in one day. Um, who's to say that when he finished um, the last few verses of 
of uh, Mark that he was in a totally different situation, a totally different frame of mind. Um, if he was getting information, as we believe he was from Peter, um, what, I could think of a, a dozen situations in which he may have written differently, just like I would argue that Paul is in a different frame of mind and he's writing for different circumstances when he's writing 1 Timothy, he's writing 2 Timothy. And I'm, I'm just not prepared. I'm not prepared to say that 99.5% of our manuscripts uh, could be corrupted. Now, in fairness, there are other Greek witnesses that have um, some additions. There's some other Greek um, manuscripts that have little indications that maybe there was some doubt. We've maybe got a couple dozen or 30, but still that pales in con with little anomalies like that. But that pales in comparison to the overwhelming testimony of our Greek witnesses. Again, it was accepted as canonical by the earliest church, even Jerome, who's been called forth as a witness against the longer ending of Mark, accepted it as scripture. And um, it is very clear that there were early copies of Mark that didn't contain um, the longer ending of Mark. But the testimony of Irenaeus predates um, the testimony of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. So there were at least manuscripts circulating in the 180s. If you uh, take just a martyr as referring to even Bruce Metzger, uh, thinks that it's possible that Justin Martyr was referring to it. We're, we're back into the 100s. And and so we've got earlier testimony than Sinaiticus and Vaticanus from the Church Fathers. Um, and so that means that there were manuscripts that are older than Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that contained the longer ending of Mark. And it's an accident of history that those manuscripts didn't survive and Sinaiticus and Vaticanus did. If we had 10 of those manuscripts that contained it, would you change your view? Because surely there were. There absolutely were very, very early manuscripts earlier than Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that did contain it. So that's my view. Um, um, I think if you want to see the other side of it, if you want to see the... Um, perspective that Mark didn't write it. And it, it seemed to me that um, Mike Winger was leaning to the fact that it wasn't scripture. Uh, I'm not sure that he explicitly said that. Um, but to me, it seems like it was well accepted by the um, earliest church. There was um, some debate on it. Um, there was some debate on other passages of scripture that became canonical. There was debate on uh, you look at Luther, at the way he set up the canon, he said there were these books that were disputed. Um, Jude was disputed. The book of Jude was disputed. Hebrews was disputed. Um, so there are some passages that were disputed, but by and large, um, these things became accepted as canon. The longer ending of Mark became accepted as canon. And uh, it's my view that we should retain uh, the longer ending of Mark in our Bibles. Uh, so this is kind of an off-the-cuff uh, response to, to um, Mike Winger. He has uh, more of the evidence on the other side, um, but I think those are really the strongest pieces of evidence. Um, the testimony of Eusebius and Jerome, I think, is, is weighty testimony, but again, I've said it three or four times now, Jerome did end up including it in the Latin Vulgate. Um, what would become the Latin Vulgate. So I think we've got good reasons, solid reasons, to uh, retain the longer ending of Mark. And that all being said, I think there, you can watch Mike Winger's video and maybe come to a different conclusion than I do, um, and that's fine. He'll present some of the other evidence, but that's my view. Um, I just, I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that, um, 99.5% of our manuscripts, Greek witnesses, could be corrupted. Okay, parting question. If two or three manuscripts appeared that didn't contain John chapter 21, and 
a bunch of scholars came up to you and said that there were stylistic differences in the Greek between chapter 20 and chapter 21. And they discovered an early church father who said that the majority of witnesses that he had seen didn't contain John chapter 21. Would you throw chapter 21 out? Now, in fairness, Mike Winger thinks you should keep uh, Mark in, in your Bible, but I don't think he came to a full um, em embrace of accepting it as scripture. And so I'm going to accept John chapter 21 completely as scripture, despite what critical scholars have said. I'm going to accept 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus as part of scripture, and I'm also going to accept the longer ending of Mark as part of scripture. Now, I'm respectful of people who have come to other conclusions. I'm respectful of Mike Winger. It, I, like I said, I, I think he's a good, honest um, hearted person. And if we live close to each other, I'm sure we'd be friends. Um, but this is just a different perspective on it. And uh, so anyways, I hope that's helpful for, to you. Just some random thoughts. Um, Look at the other side of it, study the other side, see what you think, and uh, you can do some pushback if you want, but that's my two cents for what it's worth. I should just say something briefly about the shorter ending. I should have mentioned that um, in, the, um, in the video there, uh, but there are about six uh, manuscripts that um, after verse eight, they say, but they reported briefly to Peter and those with him all that they had been told. And after these things, Jesus sent out through them um, from east uh, to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. I'm quoting Bruce Metzger's uh, textual commentary here. And then he goes on to say, all of these witnesses except um, ITK, um, also continue with verses 9 through 20. So even of those half dozen or so manuscripts that um, don't, uh, that, that actually have what's been called the shorter ending, I almost think it's a misnomer because they all continue, every single one of the Greek witnesses all continue um, with the traditional longer ending. There's one Latin manuscript that does not. Um, so my focus in this has been on the uh, Greek witnesses. Um, you could get into the virginal evidence and things like that, but my focus for this video has pretty much been on um, the Greek witnesses. So I felt like I needed to add that little addendum. <laughs>